Yeah, thank you very much, Hubert, for this um, kind introduction. Um, yeah, we, we would like to present today a book that is not that does not yet exist, but is in the process of being crafted, authored, and designed. It will document a multimodal collaboration project between us, Ignacio and me, and the CRC Theory Tandem and Nikolaus, our tandem external partner. Our collaboration began in spring of 2022 with the goal of stimulating and reflecting on the development of theory within the context of the CRC. As a reminder, especially for those who were unable to attend the last two days of the conference, the CRC Refiguration of Spaces seeks to develop a theory of spatial refiguration to, um, to account for societal transformations of the contemporary. It comprises 16 research projects from the fields of sociology, anthropology, geography, communication studies, architecture, planning, and visual arts. The overarching hypothesis guiding our research is that societal transformation can no longer be understood as an epochal shift from modernity to postmodernity to late modernity or from the nation state to globalization or from the Holocene to the Anthropocene. Rather, it should be seen as a multifaceted, simultaneous interplay of different spatial logics that reinforce and complement each other, but also generate tensions and conflicts. Empirically, the manifestation of these overlapping spatial figures can be observed in various forms, such as the changing notions of home and ontological security, conflicting regimes, as well as conflicts over territorial demarcation or the increasing fragmentation of the digital public sphere. Theorizing or building theory in such a large interdisciplinary and socially diverse research consortium is not an easy task. That is why we decided to use experimental and playful methods to get into conversation with the CRC researchers. We initiated this process by conducting two-hour multimodal workshops with all 16 sub-projects in which we asked the researchers to tell us about their work and research topics based on narrative and speculative questions, as well as props, not only verbally, but also visually and performatively. We had a table in the middle and the request was to bring empirical materials onto the table and use the vast, a vast set of additional materials to build connections and describe scenarios. Our method can loosely be compared with what Matt Reto has called critical making to describe the combination of critical thinking with hands-on making, but also to speculative design as it was aimed at materially exploring research fields as spaces of non-plausible possibilities. So we wanted to create some chaos in the beginning. Um, the guiding idea um, for the workshops was to test the interplay between analytical and visual thinking. We are particularly interested in how theoretical concepts and ideas can be translated into, into diagrams, annotations, collages of figures, and how these in turn can be made fruitful for processes of theorizing. In fact, there is a whole body of stimulating literature that, su that suggests that visual elements prove most valuable when they are open that is, when they function as dynamic tools for thoughtful exploration. In order to theorize with the help of images, diagrams, or figures, they should have the capacity to trigger our visual and theoretical imagination. This implies that they must be speculative in nature and primarily encourage abductive forms of reasoning. We videotape this mix of visual and analytical thinking as it unfolded on the workshop table, and these recordings served as a basis for Nikolaus to develop his own table configurations, a concept that hasn't been introduced yet, but which refers to the assemblage of people and things that come together with a figure 
table configurations are three-dimensional and multi-material diachromatic compositions of keywords, lines, objects, and gestures on a black background that Nikolaus arranged in his Vienna studio in response to and as, as an artistic reflection of the workshops we did with the sub-projects. In the book, each of the CRC's 16 sub-projects is each of the CRC's um, 16 sub-projects is represented by a table configuration. They allow the reader to think visually while navigating through the respective research topics as if they were traveling on a map with their finger and promote a perspective that goes beyond a purely analytical examination of the CRC's um, subject matters. By way of zooming in, they also allow for in-depth um, exploration of individual aspects. Um, well, on the other hand, we identified stories told in the workshops that in our eyes capture uh, intriguing conceptual moments in terms of spatial analysis, <clears throat> and then ask the researchers to put these stories into paper. The outcome of this rather time-intensive process <clears throat> is an engaging collection of 45 stories that translates some of the empirical findings into literary forms, field observations, into compelling narratives, and offer also speculations or speculative reinterpretations of research topics. The stories were painstakingly developed in close collaboration with editor Mark Sou, whom we sincerely thank for his work and his wonderful success in guiding social scientists and engineers and architects to in creative writing. Now, before we present uh, four of these stories and the spatial figures hidden in them, we would like to offer a few thoughts on uh, our methodology here. Although our atlas of spatial figures is largely composed of artistic and literary formats, it is, a book, it is a book about experimental forms of exploring space in a scientific research context. First and foremost, the book tests making a shift from analysis as the standard mode of social science writing towards description. The core of the book is indeed storytelling, 45 literary, ethnographic, sci-fi stories that show how things are or might be in different corners of the world. By doing that, these stories tell in more or less subtle ways larger stories of the or about their refiguration of spaces. We call our book Atlas because it collects spatial figures. For each story we collected from the CRC projects, we define a unique spatial figure that CRC researchers either encounter while doing field work or use while talking and writing about their fields or also figures that we saw in their stories. The list includes the following. Abode, address, barricade, blank, bridge, cave, camp, chamber, coast, commute, colony, compound, couch, crack, flat, forest, gate, ground, habitat, hollow, hospital, hub, interface, itinerary, layer, map, node, odyssey, plantation, platform, resort, retreat, roller coaster, sanctuary, salon, shade, shelter, stage, threshold, trajectory, tunnel, turnstile, vortex, wall, web. Keeping with our approach of describing, we don't analyze the meaning of these figures but we tell stories about their etymological origins so as to keep them as open as possible. Similar to the analysis of metaphors, etymological stories can be used to figure out horizons of meaning. Some words have complex layers of meaning and are used in differently in different languages, even if they might share the same etymological root. Their meaning might also change over time. For spatial research, etymologies can be used speculatively to develop multiple readings for spatial interpretations 
and to further stimulate empirical analysis. As you will have, have noticed, these spatial figures are quite different from the ones that we have been discussing for the last two days. In the introduction to the book, we distinguish uh, between two types of spatial figures, which we call topological and topographic. So topological figures are basically spatial diagrams that represent abstract types of spatial arrangements or relationships between objects or entities. The four figures that we have been discussing in our symposium uh, might qualify as topological figures. They can be traced back to ideal types of spatial practice, each of which relates objects or entities by imagining or acting upon them in a very specific way. They might delimit, connect, transverse, or identify uh, points. Topographic figures, uh, the ones that we collect in our book, can be derived from very concrete spatial arrangements. They are based on an empirical distribution of localized objects and entities forming this spatial figure. A bridge, a camp, an anthill would be vivid examples of this. In essence, topographic figures emerge empirically similarly to the way in which metaphors work in language. And I have to say we were very inspired here by the work of Lakoff and Johnson and his book, Metaphors We Live By, where they basically explore the metaphors hidden in, or inscribed in everyday terms and, and, and words, and how these metaphors uh, shape the way in which we understand the world. It is important to note, though, that these two type of figures uh, are not mutually exclusive, and some of these figures can move back and forth between topographic and topological functions. For example, the network uh, can be both a spatial metaphor used to make sense of a very specific empirically observable arrangement, but also as an abstract figure, as a, an abstract spatial diagram that produces and organizes space in a very specific way. In addition to this, in addition to this more let's say, abstract and conceptual work that we were doing, we were also, and we are also interested in understanding uh, more empirically as well, the vectors of the contemporary trans refiguration of spaces. So the book and through the stories will also have something to say about uh, how the world is changing spatially. So by looking at the stories, we basically identify four thematic areas that revolve around the problems of extimacy, uninhabitability, ferality, and splintering. We are now going to introduce these four themes through four stories, while Nicolaus will uh, uh, visually reveal some of the figures that are ingrained in these stories. So we're gonna switch the setting now uh, and we are going to move over the, there, and I think Nicolas is going to also move over there. Extimacy, turning homes inside out. The first thematic section or vector or, of spatial refiguration revolves around the home. What we found interesting about many of the stories was that they challenged the Western idea of the home as a place of intimacy. Traditionally, the home has been seen as a private and sacred space where individuals can retreat from the public world and be authentic, that is, who they really are. However, many of the collected stories speak of homes under conditions of extimacy. The term, originally coined by Lacan, refers to how our most intimate desires are shaped by the external, the strange, the alien. Similarly, we are interested in the ways in which the space of the home is expressed, exposed and intersects by logics um, that undo or challenge experiences of intimacy, that speak of homes that are turned inside out, territorialized, and how they become something else, a dangerous or a defenseless um, place, or a place of political and economic struggle. In the process, homes 
often become temporary public spaces for a variety of reasons. Here is an example. Blind Date, a story by Daniel Gronefeld, student researcher in the sub-project Locative Media, New Spatial Realities Between Conflict and Coexistence. Although hours had passed since sunset, Leo was not surrounded by complete darkness. The intrusive light of a street lamp had only reluctantly allowed itself to be dimmed by a picnic blanket that barely covered the large window of his living room. Leo's iPhone buzzed and the screen lit up. I'm a bit late, sorry, the message said. Leo opened Grinder and replied, no problem, see you on the dark side, smiley. The screen switched off, his eyes narrowing in the obscurity until the black and white poster on the wall with the words, but we are not animals, became legible again. Thoughts flickered through Leo's mind. What image could the guy have of Leo, given that the few furnishings thrown together by inheritance and leftovers from the previous tenant could likely be the most private insight he could ever have, aside from sex, of course. In fact, he really had no reason to worry about it. In his personal dark room, their eyes would be busy making out more than the mere silhouettes of their bodies, and the furniture would quickly recede from attention. During the time Leo had lived with his ex-partner, Ali, he wasn't allowed to use their flat as a, as a place for his occasional grinder encounters. For Ali, home was a safe space, meant exclusively for himself, his partner, and close friends. On their very first date, Leo had received Ali in the small room of Leo's shared flat, although Ali lived alone in a spacious department. Only after they had been a couple for a year or so did Leo move in with Ali. Whenever Leo met other men at their places, he never stayed the night. He did this in an attempt to separate the physical side from the emotions he reserved for his partner. Now that he was single and living alone again, Leo, or Leo offered his flat as a meeting place in case the other didn't or couldn't do so, or was outside the 20 minute, minute radius that quite consist consistently delineated Leo's dating activities. He usually felt fairly secure inviting strangers, and so it was today. The man who was keeping him waiting in the gloom of his living room had seemed somewhat uneasy about Leo's less than common suggestion of, of meeting in the dark. He hesitated at first, but then agreed on the condition that Leo would receive him naked and seated on the floor. A safety measure, smiley, he explained. Having been worried about his safety in his early days of grinder, grinder, grinder uh, Leo was able to empathize. He had always shared his location with a friend and placed his belongings just in front of the door so that he could hear his keys scratching over the floor in case someone entered the flat while they were in action. He had stopped doing so, though, because the effort didn't seem to him to justify the lack of danger he felt. By now, Liu was starting to feel a little cold and even more worryingly, nowhere near as horny as he had been at the time he had invited the guy over. He flicked through the photographs that had triggered his desire for an immediate meeting less than two hours ago. As the anticipation was returning, a message popped up. I'm at, the, I'm at the door, let me in. With a hint of a smile on his lips, his mouth quietly formed the word please, voicing his understanding of the emoji that marked the end of the sentence. Spatial figure, salon, 
The French term salon can be linked to the old Italian word salone, which both referred to a large hall or living room. The French and Italian words likely have roots in the Latin word salone or saloneum, derived from salire, which means to leap or to jump. The idea is that such gatherings in the reception room might be lively and animated, akin to leaping and jumping conversations. The word has taken on different meanings over time, such as reception room of a Parisian lady in 1810, the woman who hosts a salon is a salonniere. The meaning gathering of fashionable people is from 1888. The meaning annual exhibition of contemporary paintings and sculpture in Paris is from 1875. And it's originally being held in one of the salons of the Louvre from a secondary sense of the ver French word spacious or elegant apartment for reception of company or artistic exhibitions. The meaning establishment for hairdressing and beauty care is from 1913. An inevitability. Urbanity is not what it used to be. The second cluster of stories contains stories about urban spaces. What characterizes them is that they challenge the idea of the city as a space that can be appropriated by individuals, groups, and communities, and thus become a site of affective attachment, individual emancipation, or cultural representation. The city has long been imagined in this way, as a space where the struggles for recognition and the right to the city understood as the right to shape the city by inhabiting it take place. Yet many of the stories we collected challenge this reading of the city, showing vividly the impossibility of appropriating urban space. The term uninhabitability was coined recently by Abdul Malik Simone. It invites us to rethink how people relate or rather do not relate to the city. Interestingly, Simone imagines an uninhabitability as something that might be liberating as it enables, and I quote here, residents to spiral, to spiral in and out Propel, them, propel themselves into the larger urban surrounds and then uh, bear back down again into the familiar places now rendered unfamiliar. Our stories of urban inhabitability do not have necessarily such a liberating connotation. These are rather stories about violence, alienation, dislocation, fear, and misrecognition. <coughs> Here is one example. Where to Flee, a story by Kusei Amar, architect and research associate in the subproject Architectures of Asylum. Rashid tried to take a deep breath, but the fresh breeze of the morning dawn got stuck between his ribs, tightening his chest. The pickup truck was ready to head to the south. He climbed up and squeezed himself between a sleepy woman and a young man with white paint on his sleeves. There were about 10 people on the truck. Rashid didn't know any of them. He was thinking about his family, not sure if he wanted to go back to the village to see if they were still there. If they weren't, where would he search for them? Since the last attack of Boko Haram, Three weeks ago, he had been on his own. His mother was um, able to convince his father to leave the village, but it was too late. The family had decided to leave after the year's first harvest, but a week later, Boko Haram took over the village. They killed many and kidnapped the young girls. During the melee, he, did, he hid in the forest, the only one who was able to run away. 
about a week ago, he started walking south, avoiding the military checkpoint he had heard about. While on foot, he met some people on the truck, also heading to Lagos, where Rashid would try to find his uncle Mohammed, and hitched a ride. Arriving at the vastness of Lagos, he headed to the market his uncle had once told him about. It was the biggest in West Africa, he had said, and was where he met up with clients who needed to exchange dollars or euros to Naira. At its rowdy entrance, Rashid could not imagine how big it was, but already it seemed enough, it seemed, um, enough to swallow him. At a loss of where to start his search, Rashid relied on the fact that on the streets of Lagos, friends are very easily made. You can always find a willing one of the 24 million people to, to chat with. He described Uncle Mohammed to many, middle height, a white mustache, and a golden corner tooth, and to his surprise, the vendors somehow immediately knew whom he was talking about. But they sent him from one corner to the next, forcing him to remember details from each location as he tracked his way back, fish, a yam lady, and so on. It seemed impossible, simply too many stores. After searching and waiting for hours, it was his uncle who found him. The day was long and Rashid was now relieved. They hugged and he suddenly felt how hungry he was. They got a, a two jollof rice dishes and sat together on the sidewalk and he told his uncle what had happened. In the evening they arrived at the compound where his uncle had lived for 10 years, only returning twice to visit his old northern village. The camp he shared with 25 others is illegal, Uncle Mohammed explained, because the city officially has no place for them from the north. The government doesn't want to have us here, he said. Theirs was built on rented land, but there was no contract to regulate, he continued. We pay for each square meter, but still nothing here belongs to us. A couple of weeks pass at the camp and Rashid, now a resident, has learned to ride a motorcycle. Through one of his uncle's compound friends, he agreed to work afternoon shifts driving people from the bus stop to their home in the camp. But the young men working at the landowners bully him and hit, hit Rashid, charging him more than the others for using the parking place while waiting for customers. Today is Sunday, a day that looks much like the day Rashid arrived. Together with his new friend Ahmad, a kid born in the camp, he now plays football at the unofficial IDP Sunday League, where IDP teams travel from one camp to the next to enjoy football matches. On this particular day, Rashid had walked a lot earlier, and his left foot also hurt after the last football game, where he crashed into a boy twice as big. Later in the day, Uncle Mohammed pulls Rashid aside, telling him that he must now manage his life on his own. Continuing, he said if Rashid didn't find a shift on the motorcycle, he would have to get out onto the streets and find something else to do. But here at the camp, no one takes care of you and there is no governmental support. You are invisible. Rashid sees young kids selling stuff to people in the cars. At 15 years of age, back in his hometown, he would have been at school. He was interested in becoming a police officer, but his uncle had laughed at the idea and told him he needed a lot of money for that. When Rashid tells Ahmed that he used to go to school and that he can write and read, he answers, but you are riding a motorcycle now. It doesn't matter anymore. Spatial figure, compound. The noun compound has its etymological roots, both in the Latin verb componere, which reflects the idea of bringing elements together, and the Arabic verb quamat, which roughly translates to to be built up or to be formed. 
Thus, the word had been used first in English during the early Middle Ages to refer to a combination of two or more things and has proliferated to a variety of physical, conceptual, and metaphorical contexts ever since. For example, in the course of the British expansion, it came to be used a, a term to describe an enclosed residence or the enclosure for a factory or settlement of Europeans in the East, probably further influenced by the Dutch notion of kampung or the Portuguese adaption of the Malay kampong in the 1670s. Later, the term was also used in South Africa to refer to diamond miners' camps in the 1890s and to large fence-in residences in the 1940s. In addition, today the usage of it has spread to the realms of finance, law, and chemistry, always revolving around the basic idea of an arrangement. Ferality, the more than human production of space. The third cluster or vector of refiguration turns around the role of living and non-living, non-human entities, and how they enter in relation with people and institutions, thus producing different spatial arrangements. Inspired by Anat Singh's Feral Atlas, we think of these stories as telling stories about feral environments that challenge our two human ways of conceiving of space and are not easily controlled or understood by humans. In some of the stories we collected, we encountered rather non-humans that are fully indifferent to human spatial arrangements, challenging them, overflowing them, and ultimately questioning their existence. These are stories that point to the limits of the re relationality between humans and non-humans but we also collected stories about intimate entanglements between humans and non-human entities. These involve speculative stories, taking, for example, the perspective of trees to describe their interaction with humans, thus suggesting a more than human production of space. You are COSA, a story by Margarita Test, cultural anthropologist and research associate in the sub-project Urban Microclimate Planning Regime. You are part of something bigger called COSA, which means yellow sand, an aggregate of aerosols made of liquid and solid particles suspended in air, in the air, visible and invisible at the same time. Your life journey started millions of years ago probably somewhere in the Gobi Desert. You emerge as sand in this splendid and tranquil desert ecosystem, born and ever traveling, thanks to the winds. It is 2019, and the journey you're embarking on now starts in the desert. Heavy deforestation due to extensive logging in northern China allows you to first travel farther south than expected. Over Changxi province, because of soil erosion due to overgrazing, you move speedily. Across China, your character, materiality, and properties change, but you are still very light, and you stay suspended in the air. Throughout your journey, you mix, reassemble, and disassemble everything you encounter. Across burning coal, you aggregate with mercury, cadmium, and other heavy metals. You pass countryside, fields, stock farms, and cities, becoming one with pesticides, antibiotics, plastic, and hormone-mimicking phthalates. <laughs> you meet and ferry bacteria and viruses, too you are constantly transforming. When you reach Korea, it is spring. You cross a series of weather radars which alarm many meteorologists. The Korean government sends a warning to the whole population. 
everybody is prohibited from outdoor activities. Parts of you get caught in air purifiers at the entrance of Korean homes. At the country's border, you begin your travel over the ocean. Arriving at the Japanese coast, you encounter Fukuoka in northern Kyushu. There, there, a fisherman looks at the sea and says, it's China's fault that I cannot see the horizon today. Some of your components are infinitely small. Scientists call them fine particular matter. Your concentrations of ultra fine dust now exceeds 800 nanomillimeters. Some of your components reach the lungs of a Japanese woman, woman living in the area, and you travel deep into her alveoli. She starts coughing. She blinks many times because some of your sandy parts get stuck in her eyes. Your ultra fine components are so thin they travel through her blood and reach other organs in her body. You have become one with something else again, this time in an undesirable intimacy with a human body living in Fukuoka. You exist and resonate in the time of a breath and in the deep time of sand formations. You exist and move in the microscopic space of a bronchus and across thousands of kilometers. Spatial figure, vortex. The etymology of vortex traces back to the Latin vertex, which referred to a turning or whirling motion, often referring to the spinning top of a water or air in a spiral motion. It has been used in English since the 17th century. The Latin vertex has been linked to the Proto-Indo-European root ver, meaning to turn or to bend. The root has given rise to words relating to turning, twisting, and spinning in various languages. In modern English, vortex is used to describe a mass of fluid or air that is in a state of rotational motion around a center, creating a whirlpool-like effect. It can refer to natural phenomena like tornadoes or to artificial effects like water draining in a sink. Beyond the literal sense, vortex is sometimes used metaphorically to describe situations or events that involve a swirling or chaotic motion, often with powerful forces at play. Splintering, what happened to the digital public sphere. The fourth vector of refiguration is splintering. The concept of splintering was introduced by Graham and Marvin to show how new physical and digital infrastructures can promote the fragmentation of cities along economic, social, and technological lines. Something we must also observe today for the global digital public sphere. In its early days, cyberspace was conceived by its creators and early user, users as an idealistic realm that could foster democratization and the open exchange of knowledge, information, and experience. Today's reality, however, stands in stark contrast to this vision. Large platform companies have established monopolies over internet use and control the flow of data Authoritarian regimes use firewalls to restrict online communication and even order shutdowns to quell protests. In addition, an examination of the material components of the internet reveals a significant regional divide. The so-called Global South, which predominantly provides the raw materials, such as metals and rare, er rare earths needed to manufacture cables, antennas, and chips, faces a stark divide from North America and Europe, where the majority of traffic is concentrated. Of ants and algorithms, a feminist internet utopia. 
a story by Nadine Chabé, sociologist and research associate in the subproject Control Space, the Spatiality of Digital Infrastructures in Contextures, Maps and Discourses. The year is 2065 and the world is no longer as we know it. 20 years earlier, the former mighty big tech players completely centralized the internet at the expense of social equality and the climate. It was a space formed in their image, full of inequality, discrimination, and misogyny. The crisis of commercial digital infrastructure had reached an apex to destroying large swaths of the earth. The need for action to save the planet and individual freedom became urgent, giving rise to resistance movements from a parallel underground internet, the feminist internet which grew rapidly to combat the old patriarchal giants and demolished their monopolies. Battles spanning both physical and cyber spaces raged between the big tech powers and the feminist challengers. The confluence of digital data and physical infrastructure across the world, especially at concentrated network nodes, such as highly guarded server locations, became targets for both sides. Eventually emerging triumphantly, the resistance movement took over. Former power balances were shifted completely, establishing free and equitable feminist forms of social organization and internet governance by dismantling monopolies ranging from nation states to mega firms. To further counteract the failures of the past, the process of recovering the planet through a more sustainable use of resources began. A key leader of the resistance movement emerged in the figure of philosopher and feminist legend Donna Haraway, already a seminal thinker over half a century earlier during the period of the old internet. Beginning with her influential essay from 1985, A Cyber Manifesto. Haraway had envisioned a world in which technological developments fundamentally changed society to overcome gender boundaries and eliminate inequalities, and her writings and thinking became a cornerstone for the groups that formed the feminist internet. During the early years of the rise of big tech, Haraway and researchers from the Global South were keenly involved in the invention of feminist cyborg ants, an advanced new technology and perfect symbiosis of tech and nature. The invention went on to become a turning point in winning the fight against big tech, not only as fighting and healing machines, but also as a vehicle to, for prolonging the life and mind of Haraway, long past the biological constraints of her physical body, which dated from the last century. Using then nascent scientific developments in artificial intelligence, her mind was virtually frozen and transferred to the ant queen before Haraway's bodily death. Fully becoming a cyborg ant in 2055, this transformation allowed her thought processes to live on and communicate with the network. The invention of these hybrid machine creatures became one materialization of Haraway's vision of new world inhabiting cross-species alliances holding the potential for undetermining identitarian un undermining, oh, sorry, for undermining identitarian binaries and collectively healing the planet. Led bravely by cyborg Haraway, the ants fought and protected the resistance movement of the feminist internet during the ups upspring against big tech. Their biological characteristics evolved over millions of years proved advantages for the struggle. Ants had developed communication and cooperation abilities ideal for reacting quickly. Ants also live in matriarchy without a central authority and interact democratically, for example, in sharing information. Newly developed into a trillion-sized hybrid cyber colony, they could react effectively to cyber attacks through their new encryption technology. 
Furthermore, they learned to work synergistically with the planetary ecosystem to quickly counteract possible destruction, which also contributed significantly to the Earth's climate recovery in the coming era. After the taxing overthrow of big tech, the new emergent feminist internet was built on top of the old internet. Ossified infrastructure was refigured to create new data networks, flexible linkages, and worldwide network coverage that finally offered true access to everyone. This led to a new level of global harmony and the space of possibilities with open and transparent networks, equal and free communication, regardless of hierarchies or capitalistic imbalances, imbalances and the implement implementation of new anti-discriminatory, non-binary social codes and technologies. Diverse ways of living on the planet became possible too. The inspiring cyborg and technology was made accessible to more people in established body hacking labs, enabling all cyborgs and humans to live in unison within the new feminist society. A robust platform was thus constructed, and for now, the feminist internet imaginaries have prevailed, turning hopes for utopia of the reimagination of internet space into reality. Special figure, colony. The, la the Latin word colonia is derived from the verb colere, which means to cultivate or to inhabit. It referred to a settlement or farm often established by the ancient Romans in newly conquered or remote areas. These settlements were typically inhabited by Roman citizens who worked the land and served a specific purpose, such as providing resources for the Roman Empire. In English, colony refers to a group of people who establish a community in a foreign and distant land, forming tightly knit communities and maintaining some connection with their home country, which might govern or support the colony. The word colony has also been used to describe a group of organisms, such as animals or bacteria, that live together in a cooperative and organized manner. For example, an ant or bee colony refers to a community of individual insects working together for the benefit of the group. So the more poetic and artistic part is over now, but we will have a conclusion. <laughs> yeah. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, we have some, also some more analytical clues that we draw from, from this intervention um, that we just want to share with you. And then, of course, we can have a Q&A afterwards. So first, um, we think it is interesting to note that many of the topographic figures, if, if you remember the list from the beginning, the 45 um, different topographic figures, can actually be related to the four topological figures, that is, to spatial practices of delimiting, connecting, traversing, and identifying. Resort, camp, cabin, barricade, or wall, for instance, are clearly territorial figures, while habitat, couch, hospital, 
or even plantation goes back to different forms of placemaking. Relating these topographic figures to the four topological figures underscores the vast diversity in the way territories, places, routes, and networks are formed. This perspective can help develop ver varieties of topological figures. We also discussed this um, in the um, plenary session um, just before. As an example, consider routes, which can be distinguished not only by the manner of movement, occasionally linear, at times circular, or even following loops, think of the vortex, but also what they instigates, what instigates the movement within them. The movement can originate either from the object in motion itself, such in the case of the itinerary as a planned sequence of a journey, or from an external force setting things in motion, as seen in the trajectory of a bullet fired from a pistol, an odyssey, or, an, or a vortex. The specific dynamics in each case significantly influence the resulting spaces. However, it's also evident that not all topographic figures can be directly cor correlated with um, topological figures. This is particularly true for what I would call in-between spaces, such as the threshold, shades, the plank or the empty spaces, probably also the niche. Um, yeah, so there remains some, some things that we still have to figure out. Yeah. Well, secondly, um, working with these stories has <clears throat> enabled us to pinpoint what we have called vectors of prefiguration, extimacy, uninhabitability, ferality, and splintering that perhaps were not initially anticipated within the framework of the CRC agenda, or even as we started working on this. These vectors now present us with the collective task uh, of assessing the relevance for uh, our research program. If the impertinent, we must delve into the analysis of these vectors and incorporate them into the discussion of uh, refiguration of spaces. We would like to emphasize two questions that arise from this. The first one becomes evident in the visual translation Nicolaus has just made, where we observe that these four vectors and their associated spatial figures are in, 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 intricately uh, intertwined. An essential empirical question we need to systematically explore and analyze is the empirical interconnection of these vectors of refiguration. For example, how is an inevitability empirically linked to ferality or to splintering or to extimacy uh, or with all of the above, right? How these processes potentially reinforce or contradict each other? And most importantly, how do people in their daily lives navigate with these overlapping refigurations of homes cities, more than human ecologies, and digital infrastructures. The second question that follows from this, uh, and that we can try to analyze empirically, uh, pertains precisely to this situated nature uh, of, this, of these refigurations. So the shifts that we are witnessing, such as the transition from the home as a space of intimacy to one of extimacy, can be articulated in these terms, with these concepts, only as long as we look at this from a very specific Western European uh, standpoint. The research agenda that these stories bring uh, forth encompasses the various forms and meanings that refiguration processes can take in different regions uh, around the world. Identifying these regional disparities, as well as continuities, in how extimacy and inevitability, ferality, or splintering mold the refiguration of spaces could allow us to begin mapping and charting the geographies of modernist colonial and postcolonial entanglements. This is, we think, a, an exciting set of research questions that we hope to pursue together uh, over the, the next few years. Um, our book, uh, our forthcoming book, uh, 
will be a first step in this uh, direction. Um, but its value, uh, we believe, goes beyond this potential research agenda. Uh, the book is mostly a testament to the extremely generous spirit of collaboration that we have in our CRC. Um, to have a extremely busy, uh, to have a group of extremely busy scholars willing to invest so much time and energy in participating in our rather strange multimodal workshops and then writing these literary, speculative, and even science fiction stories, and then to go through a very long process of revision and rewriting is a real luxury that we really know how to appreciate. So in that sense, the Atlas of Special Figures is first and foremost a testimony or a testament to, to, to that spirit of collaboration that we have in this group. Um, we can name everyone now, but to conclude, we just would like to express our uh, gratitude to the people who are helping us and who have helped us bring this book uh, to life. And some of them are here in the room. So uh, they are Katia Gretzinger, uh, Mark So, uh, Tiziana Ratchev, Racheva, that's a mistake here, and Daniel Jartzik. And of course, to all of the authors of the stories, this is the most important one. Thank you very much. <laughs>